Jeremiah 29, here we go. Jeremiah chapter 29. I wanna teach a message entitled, His House, My House. His House, My House. So here we go. Chapter 29 of Jeremiah. The scripture gives us probably the most noted memory verse of the Old Testament. It has to be in the top three. Most everybody has quoted it sometime, Jeremiah 29, 11. I, the Lord, know the plans I have for you, plans for welfare, not calamity, to give you a hope and a future. How many have ever said that or heard somebody say Jeremiah 29, 11? Very common. What most people don't know is that before 29, 11, there's some other things that the Lord spoke to the people of, or the Jewish people living in the nation of Judea. Now, let's frame it, take 30 seconds. So Israel, after the death of King Solomon, divided into two nations because uh, Jeroboam and Rehoboam uh, divided the nation after Solomon's reign as king. Part of the nation went north and formed the nation of Israel with the capital of Samaria. And then the other tribes stayed in the south and formed Judea with the capital city of Jerusalem. So there was a period of time <coughs> in which the kingdom was divided between Israel and Judea. So Israel in the north, they fell as a nation uh, in six, or 720 BC to the Assyrians. The southern nation of Judah lived on for about 117 more years um, in, in Judah. And then the Babylonians came and attacked them and brought their great downfall. And so this is about to go down in the south. They're about to go into captivity for 70 years. And the Lord gives the math. Jeremiah 29, 10, the verse before 11, it says, 70 years I have called you to go to captivity. But I, the Lord, know the, know the plans I have for you to bless you and to uh, bring welfare, not calamity, to give you hope in the future. But he names the number of years, not seven weeks, not seven days, not seven months. 70 years they're gonna go into exile. That's a, that's a lifespan for some. And so the Lord is telling them, you're about to go away. It's about to get rough for the next 70 years. But I'm telling you the number of years you're gonna go away. I'm telling you that on the backside of the going away is a life of promise and prosperity, but it's gonna get rough for 70 years. And so what do you do if you are Israel? <clears throat> I mean, if you're the Jewish people and you've been told that for 70 years you're gonna go on a massive hiatus of correction you're gonna go into exile. So it's literally 900 miles from Jerusalem to Babylon. And it started in 606 BC, this 70 year cycle of judgment. Most scholars believe the 70 years was connected to the 490 years in Israel's history in which they didn't let the land rest every seventh year. So there was 70 missing years of rest over 490 years. So they, they believe that the Lord was taking back that rest of the land is part of the judgment against their idolatry. So they're gonna go away for 70 long, long years. Very easy in that moment for the Jewish people to get real small and meager, to shrink, if you knew you were gonna go on that kind of seasonal uh, break from being your own people for 70 long years, what do you think the Lord told them at the beginning of that 70 years? Now, when I look at our, our country the last few years, I kind of feel like we've gone through a similar disruption. I don't wanna read too much into the prophecy, but I will tell you, beginning in 2020, it sure feels like something shifted. As a matter of fact, I heard one of the great Bible teachers of my life, his name is Cy Rogers, in 2016, tell a group of pastors, there's about a thousand of us in this room, and he took us on a journey backwards, and he said every 90 years, there's a global event. He went all the way back 500 years 
in 90 year cycles in which there was a, a global event. And in 2016, he said the last one was in 1930. After the fall of the stock market in the fall of 29, the whole planet, the whole planet went upside down in 1930. And for 10 years, there was a global downturn during the Great Depression from Europe, South America, the United States. Everybody was impacted by that. He said, if this same thing holds true, he said this in 16, and 1930 was that moment, he goes, something's going to happen in 2020 that's going to cause the entire world to turn upside down and take one giant step backwards. Now, he said this four years before 2020. Now, I don't know how your 2020 began four years ago today as we were becoming 2019 to 2020 on New Year's Eve. I was in Morro Bay. When I was in Morro Bay down by Monterey with some friends, we woke up on New Year's Day tomorrow, four years ago in 2020, and I was watching football, the parades, and the whole bit. And all of a sudden, I get a text that my friend Carl Huss, who is a missionary to Mexico, in his 40s, has been taken to the hospital with pneumonia. Oh, man, we got to pray for Carl. He's down there in central Mexico. Okay. I get a text three hours later that he's died on New Year's Day 2020. It was shocking that he died of pneumonia, which we think now at that point was early COVID. Three days later, my Aunt Grace passed away in her apartment. They found her body. The following day, one of the dearest ladies in my life, a part of our church was in Branson, Missouri. She fell dead. The following Wednesday, <clears throat> I was president of North Central University in Minneapolis. And we find the body of a 22-year-old senior who died of a heart attack in his dorm room on a Saturday. We're not 10 days into the year. A few days after that, Cy Rogers, the man who gave me that prophecy in 2016, passes away in New Zealand. A couple days after that, Kobe Bryant is killed in a helicopter crash. I'm going, what is this all about? What's up with 2020? And then little did we know that with COVID and then the murder of Floyd, the elections that fall, it just felt like everything got tipped in 2020. And I couldn't believe what that one guy said, that 2020 would be the year in which something would cause the whole planet to be in, in, a, in the same state of confusion. So Israel is about to go into a 70 year cycle. I know a lot of people today feel, man, with all that's happening and especially 2024 is the election and we're all kind of going, Ugh! we're wincing like this. How many are kind of thinking like, oh, okay, here we go. A good year to get off Twitter or whatever, <laughs> just for self-preservation. Here's what the Lord told, told Israel or told the Jewish people. In verse four, it says, this is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel says to all the captives. He is exiled to Babylon from Jerusalem. Build houses and plan to stay. Plant gardens and eat the food they produce. Marry and have children. Then find spouses for them that you may have many great, great grand or grandchildren. Multiply do not dwindle away. What a great Bible word, dwindle, dwindle, dwindle. He's telling the Jewish people, I don't care what your surroundings, what the circumstances are. This is no hour to get meek and to get small. I want you to increase. I want you to plant gardens. I want you to build houses, Hope City. This is your first prophecy for 2024. We cannot live meek, mild, and we cannot withdraw in this hour, friends. We've got to build the house. We've got to plant the garden. We've got to get married. We've got to have kids. We got to see our kids have kids. We got to give them names and find them spouses. We cannot dwindle away. We must increase. 
no matter what the world around us is doing. Somebody give the Lord an amen. amen. Cannot dwindle. We must increase, friends, in this day and age. I don't know about you, but there are many times I feel like getting kind of small and withdrawn and just when it all passes, wake me up. He said, I want you to plant your gardens and build your houses. I want you to get married. For some of you, that's a word from the Lord. How many are ready to get married in 2024? Okay. All of you in the back that are shy, it's all up front. It's where all the energy is right here. How many want to have some children? Somewhat of a reserved uh, right there. How many have some more children? Uh, okay, you see it kind of went down a little bit. How many want to find the spouse for your child? That's what I like in this because you find, I'm going to find the spouse for my kids. But we are told to increase and not to dwindle. Now watch. Let's jump ahead 70 years. 70 years they lived there, and then after 70 years, a new king, King Cyrus, he becomes the king of the Medo-Persian Empire, which takes over for Babylon. He understands the 70 years that have been assigned for the Jews. Now he tells them to go home. So he blesses Zerubbabel to take back thousands of people back to Jerusalem, and to start to rebuild it. <clears throat> and so Zerubbabel takes thousands of people home that have been born in this captivity. Some have lived through it. Most are new. They don't know anything but stories about the temple and the city. And they go back to Jerusalem to rebuild it. Now they're on it for two years. They got momentum. There's great, there's great strength happening through the people. The, the rubble's being moved. But then after two years, man, they lose their willpower. That happens a lot when we set goals. Most of you have a Bible reading goal. I hope you have a Bible reading goal. A lot of people start to read their Bibles in January. Genesis and Exodus. And then by Leviticus, they die in the wilderness just like the Jewish people. <laughs> it's over. They never get out. Never get past the wilderness in my Bible reading. I just die right there. <laughs> Goals are good. For two years, they made great progress rebuilding the city and rebuilding the wall. But then after two years, man, the, the flame began to grow dim and began to flicker. They lost their willpower. Their passion ran out. And friends, you don't lose your passion overnight. The loss of passion is always a process of erosion. It's something that you lose over a period of time, a little bit each day until there's a, the light goes dim and then begins to flicker, then it goes out. And so after two years, man, they lost their willpower to rebuild the city. And they went for 14 more years. And somewhere in that 14 years, their priorities completely shifted. And they forgot about building God's house. And all they wanted to do was build their own house. And so by the time the book of Haggai shows up, this little prophet, and if you could turn there, you can have time to look in your index to find out the page number. Haggai's a wonderful little two-chapter prophet. Haggai shows up 14 years after they quit building. He shows up in Jerusalem, and he has a word for them. Again, we're teaching on his house, my house. Here's what Haggai says to the people. Chapter 1, it's not on the screen, you just have to listen. He says, on August 29th, gives the date, in the second year of King Darius' reign, the Lord gave a message to the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, and he gave a message to the, who's the governor and also to Yeshua, the high priest. This is what the Lord of Heaven's army says. The people are saying the time has not yet 
come to rebuild the house of the Lord. So they even changed their theology. Hey, it's not time yet for us to do this. That's the message the people were speaking. But this is what the Lord of Heaven's armies says. Then the Lord sent this message through the prophet Haggai. Why are you living in luxurious or paneled houses while my house lies in ruins? This is what the Lord of Heaven's army says. Look what's happening to you. Don't look at the, the ruins. Look, look in the mirror. He says, you have planted much, but you harvest little. You eat, but you're never satisfied. You drink, but you're always still thirsty. You put on clothes, but you can't get warm. Your wages appear as though you were putting them in pockets with holes. What a description of the human condition. <clears throat> you're trying to eat, but you never feel full. You're clothed, but you can't get warm. You plant a garden, but you harvest so little. You work your tail off. You labor. You're paid. And it feels like you put the money in a pocket, but the pocket has holes. So here's what Haggai was telling the people. Somewhere when you went back and God was restoring this city under your leadership, you got off to a great start for two years. But then it just got slow. The opposition intensified. The progress wasn't as evident. You lost your momentum. You lost your willpower. You lost your motivation. Somewhere along the way, you shifted from the priority of his house to solely the building of my house. Now, I want to be clear about this. The Lord said, you're living in luxurious or, or paneled Houses. Now, for those of us, again, from the 1900s, we remember what paneling is? Remember paneling? Does anybody remember what paneling is? Man, this is the wrong crowd. <laughs> Eight o'clock, they knew everybody. Yeah, I like paneling. <laughs> paneling, to me, in the 70s, was not a sign of luxury. <laughs> that was not a sign of luxury. But they lived in these homes with the finest materials, and you are pouring every ounce of who you are into your own luxurious lifestyle. Now the tension we have in the Bible is this. Is my life about his house or is it about my house? Now the Lord told Jeremiah through Jeremiah, go plant gardens, go build houses. So the Lord is not against you and I building a house. Here's the problem, is that somewhere along the line, they solely committed their lives to only building their luxurious house and completely neglected the house of the Lord. Here's the way God wants us to live our life. You see, he has the power, friends, to build two houses. He has the power to build his house, and he has the power gives me the power to build my house. As long as I put his house first, it doesn't mean I put my house on hold. Friends, I, I started having, we started having babies when we were 19 and 20, and we have four of them now and 11 grandkids. I've had to have a house to live in, but I've been in the ministry. I've had to lead congregations in the building of the kingdom of God, which is his house. And when I've placed the priority of my life through my tithing, my giving, my time, my talent, and my treasure, and put his house first in my life, at the very same time, he spills over his power and his blessing in order for Karen and I to be able to build our own house. There's nothing wrong with building your house. You just can't build your house at the expense or the neglect of God's house or his kingdom. This is not just about a physical house, friends. This is about the dwelling place of his kingdom, the dwelling place of his presence. 
And it takes focus and commitment and intentionality to build a place of presence in the city of Houston. It's not gonna happen casually. It's going to happen when people full of the Holy Spirit maintain a high level of energy and focus and willpower to build his house. And as you build his house, he builds your house. When you build his house, he builds my house. These things are not competing entities. So the people of, of, of Judah, and they've been stuck in quicksand for 14 years. Their priorities entirely shifted. They even changed their theology. The Lord says this is not the time for his house. Garbage. They're just accommodating their own lifestyle. And Haggai shows up and he says, man, don't, don't look at the house. Don't look at the building project. Check out your own life. How's that working for you? You're so consumed with the luxury of your own life. But you don't really feel warm, do you? You don't really feel satisfied, do you? No matter what you drink, you're always thirsty. No matter what you plant, you're always, you're harvesting little. And no matter how hard you work, it feels like there's holes in my pockets. Something's not working in this equation. And Haggai didn't say, abandon your house. He simply said, Put my house back as your first priority. And then watch me build. You build my house. Watch me build your house. I will bless your house. I will grant your house favor. Stop fighting between his house and my house. All the Lord wants is that his house comes first. His kingdom comes first in my life. It's what I seek first. It's what I run after with all my soul, my heart, and my being. You know, giving, being generous with tithes and offerings, being generous with time and talent, being generous with fastings and prayer, being generous with worship. Lord, I'm here to build your house so there's a dwelling place. And then once you've offered it to the Lord, friends, let it go. I did a stupid thing a few years ago. I was sitting at my desk. And I was getting ready for my taxes. And I get all my forms together and I had my, all my giving records for that year that I put in, the places I gave to. And I believe I would still give all of that even if I didn't get a tax deduction. I tell myself that every year. But I still apply for the tax deduction. And so I did something really stupid. I, I looked in there, all my taxes, I keep records for 25 years. I know. Pulled it out and I, I, I added up everything I'd ever given to God. I knew it was wrong when I started doing it, but I kept doing it. I felt a twinge. It was becoming very impressive. And I added it all up and I felt the Holy Spirit said, what are you doing? I'm adding up everything I've given you. He said, was that a sacrifice? Did you offer that as a sacrifice? He said, when they brought a sacrifice to me in the scripture, it would be burnt and it would become smoke, and it would become an aroma, or it would become ash. And the dumbest thing I've ever done is I, I sat there and I tried to gather up all my ashes and put all my ashes back together and tried to get back all the smoke and all the aroma of 25 years of giving to be impressed with myself. 
And I felt the Holy Spirit rebuke me and said, once that's given to me, it's a sacrifice that becomes smoke and aroma and ash. You can't go back and reconstruct and put all those ashes back together. Don't do this. You gave it to me, it's gone. It's, it's for the kingdom. It's a sweet aroma, let it go. And I will never do that again and I, and I hope I didn't give you the idea to do the same thing. Generous with our time and our treasure and our talent so that the house of the Lord is not in ruins. Because we go, if I, if I focus on his house, what about my house? And the whole premise of this prophecy is that the Lord has the power to build your house if you will focus on building his house. It's not a trade-off, friends. And when the, when the governor and the priest heard this, Something happened. Because you would think after 14 years, man, they would lose their ability to feel. But they heard the prophecy. And the Bible says, so the Lord sparked the enthusiasm of Zerubbabel, um, the governor. And he sparked the enthusiasm of Yeshua, the priest. And the enthusiasm of the whole remnant of God's people. And they began to work on the house of the Lord. On September 21st, now the Bible says that the prophecy was given August 29th is when he spoke that. So within three weeks, three weeks, on September 21st, within three weeks, all of that uh, sluggishness and stale uh, activity of God's people had jump-started into this new movement, this new momentum, this new power, friends. I pray the same for Hope City this year. So here's your standard, not your goal. Is that, Lord, I'm committing in 2024, I'm going to build your house. I will never, the standard is, I will never put my house before your house because I believe that if that house is blessed in the city, the prosperity of the city, pray for the welfare of the city, when your house thrives, you will simultaneously then build my house. That's the standard I'm going to set as a believer in this, in my life in 2024, his house my house. Goals are good. Goals are cool. Goals are wonderful. Matter of fact, we're going to do this last little thing on our feet. Let's all stand across the building here. Goals are critical for in three ways that goals matter. And I always audit my life at the end of the year I use a little framework based on 2 Timothy 4, 11 through 13. The Apostle Paul writes, when you come, can you bring John Mark? Tychukos I have sent to Ephesus. When you come, can you bring my coat, the books, and especially the parchments? That's the secret sauce that I've used for two decades. What are you talking about? Paul says, when you come, can you bring John Mark? John Mark had been out of his life for 20 years. So the first thing I think about is the apostle Paul knew how to restore broken relationships. So I asked myself at the beginning of the year, Lord, how do I, this year, what relationships in my life need to be healed, restored, invested in? It's not about birthing new things, friends. It's about bringing stuff back from the dead. That's what makes us believers. So Lord, what relationships in my life need to be restored this year? Then he says, Tychukos I've sent to Ephesus, which means Paul knew he couldn't be two places at the same time. So he delegated his ministry. So I, I say to myself, Lord, this year, who is someone I can invest in to help them reach their dreams? Lord, what family relationship? Is there an uncle I haven't talked to in a while? Is there a brother, a sister, a sibling we haven't talked? I've been avoiding them. We're 
cold to each other. Who can I bring back into my life this year? And secondly, who can I invest in to help them reach their dreams? Then he said, when you come, can you bring my coat? So I say, Lord, what do I need to do physically, Lord, so I can optimize the potentiality of my life? Paul knew if he didn't put a coat on, he's going to get sick and die. We don't take care of ourselves, friends, physically. We're going to get sick and die. So what do I need to do? Yeah, it's about the scale, and it's also about the your blood work getting done and making sure you're, like my A1C got really high this last month, highest in my life. Pre-diabetic. It's been two days this week. Head down, sad. Saying goodbye to donuts. We've been close my whole life. <laughs> Cried over a maple bar. When you come bring my coat, Lord, what do I need to do this year to become healthy? Not that we're trying to be movie stars. Stop it. Unless you're a movie star. Most of us in this room are not. We're not trying to be models. We're not trying to be all this stuff. We're just trying to live with the full longevity and potentiality of our life. You have to take care of yourself. I'm not saying make it first, but it has to be on your short list. Then he said, when you come, can you bring the books? The books. This was Paul st stimulating his intellect and his mind. I went back when I was 47 and got a master's degree. Pretty exciting. At, I parlayed that and just went on and finished an in-person earned doctorate, PhD from Gonzaga University, got a PhD. Became a university president just semi-retired from that role this last year after six years. And now I was invited to do a postdoctoral fellowship at Princeton. So pretty cool, huh? Yeah. I got a 1.85 throughout college when I first went my, as my undergraduate. I didn't tell you that so you could applaud my achievements. I got a 1.85. Yeah, somebody cheer the 1.85. <clears throat> Someone says, is that bad or good? It's bad, folks. GPA bad right there. I never thought I had the chops intellectually in my life because of those early false stops I had, false starts I had educationally. It's a word from the Lord for some of you in this room. Okay. He said, when you come, bring the books. So I said, Lord, how can I improve my mind this year? How can I grow my vocabulary, Lord? What can I do to develop professionally this year? And then the last thing Paul said in 2 Timothy 4, 11 through 13, he said, and when you come, can you especially bring the parchments? Friends, this was the sacred scripture, different than books. This was the sacred writings. This was the spiritual life. So here's how I approach my year. I say, Lord, what relationships in my life need to be restored this year, God? Who's an emerging leader I can help invest in their time, education, schooling? Lord, what steps do I need to take to improve my health? Vitamins, how to get my blood pressure down, start walking. Lord, how do I grow professionally and intellectually this year? What are some ideas from my mind? And then, Lord, especially, how do I develop greater intimacy with you, especially the parchments? That's how I have organized my goals are good because you want to 
grow your autonomy, not your independence, your autonomy, which is self-agency, so that you can stand firm against the evil one. You have to grow a sense of autonomy. I can stand for the Lord. And I have to grow my competencies. At some point, you gotta be more of a producer than you are a consumer. You cannot live your life as a consumer. At some point, you have to produce more than you, can, than you are consuming in this life, or people will look sideways at you. You can be a consumer up until about age 20, 25, but if you don't become a producer and produce more than you consume at some point, the adult world is gonna look at you funny. You gotta grow competency. You gotta be effective. Set goals. We have to become more related to our world. We gotta grow our relatedness. I wanna connect with a dying world, a broken world. I want people to see me as something that can be a benefit to them. I wanna relate to my world better. So goal setting is very, very important as you head into this year. But the standard comes first. And here's standard number one, and then we're going to pray. Lord, I will never put my house before your house, Lord. I'm not going to just pour my soul into my personal luxury because I will be cold, I'm going to be empty, and no matter how hard I try, there will be holes in my pockets. So, Lord, your house in 2024 is the priority, the standard of my life. Somebody say amen in this room. Now, here we go. Let's cross the finish line now. Can we close our eyes? Say, Pastor Scott, I'm here today, and I'm not a, a Christian. I need my sins forgiven. I need Jesus Christ to come into my life. I want to be a believer. I want my name written in the Lamb's Book of Life, which is what the Bible says it needs to happen. I want to confess with my mouth that he's the Lord and believe I believe in my heart that he's God. He was raised from the dead. As I head into this last night of this year, I need to close the books, not just on this year, but on a life. I'm cold, I'm hungry can't get ahead I've never worked harder and I lay awake at night with insomnia I, I can't do this anymore I need Jesus Christ to wash it all away and to make me new if you're in this room today and you need Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins and to live in your heart would you put your hand up high right now across this room right now across this room Come on, look at this. This might be the biggest. And oh, wow, there's a lot of people. This is it. Keep it up, keep it up, keep it up, keep it up. We're going to pray a quick sinner's prayer and then pastor's coming. Jesus, I just thank you, Lord. Okay, pray this with me. Dear Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me, Lord, for my sins. Heal me, Lord. <coughs> From the, hurt, from the hurts. <clears throat> I believe, Jesus, that you're the Son of God. You died on the cross. You rose from the dead. And you live forever. I believe, Jesus, that you defeated Satan. And you reign eternal. Fill me, Jesus, with love and hope and a new beginning. It's a new day, Lord. Thank you for being good to me. Thank you for loving me. I am yours, Jesus, for the rest of my life. Hallelujah. Everybody said amen and amen and amen.